Hey, what's up, folks? How's everyone doing? Welcome to the stream. Uh, if you're out there in the chat, do say hi. <laughs> I know that you're, I know that you're around. Uh, this is gonna be fun. I think I'm streaming for a good, uh, I guess hour and ten minutes. Actually, that's a good question. Should I still end? schedule time hey Mitch how's it going we got M Fabian in the chat nice well I guess I'm just gonna hang out till we get more folks watching hey Martin hey Leon so I've got the I got the YouTube chat on one side and I've got the twitch chat on the other side so I see you the Twitch Chess24 chat and then the YouTube chat for Chess24 for the link. If you're somewhere else, I'm sorry, I don't know where you are. <laughs> so you'll have to find either the YouTube or the uh, the Chess24 Twitch if you want me to, to see your comments. Oh, cool. Sounds good. Sounds good, M. Fabian. Um, so yeah, guys, what I'm going to be doing today is doing a preview of my uh, 1D4 masterclass that I'm doing for CoachS. You can sign up for the class at CoachS.com. Uh, I think the first one is 50% off. It's like $6 for uh, the hour-long class. It's going to be like a group class, basically like a private stream. And uh, the topic is going to be playing 1D4. Uh, specifically, like like how to play 1D4 positions and, and 1D4 middle games. We'll probably talk a little bit about theory and like what lines I like and what I think about various systems. But my idea for the class is to give folks a sense of like how to actually approach these positions and, and what you're playing for. For the stream today, what I thought would be cool is to just take uh, take questions from, from the audience, from viewers. If you have any opening questions on, on 1D4, let me put it on the board. <laughs> Anything that, that relates to any position that starts with this move, uh, I'll tr I'll do my best to uh, to uh, to tackle it and hopefully hopefully provide some instructive value for for everyone. Okay, I'll let you guys write some questions. I got one from M Fabian already right off the bat. Nice, um, and M Fabian is asking about one d four knight of six c four e six, and for Catalan players. What are the benefits and drawbacks of knight f3 and uh, g3? That's a good question. Um, okay, my arrows here are gonna be are gonna be slow, guys. <laughs> They're gonna be a little slow. Um, yeah, really good question. So if you want to play the Catalan, you you are reduced to one of these two moves, and the uh, the pros and cons are really clear. <laughs> Taleb just says Scandinavian defense. I'm sorry, that is out of the scope of 1d4, I'm sorry to say. Although we can talk about d4, e5. It's not It's not as good as the Scandinavian, but we can talk about it. Um, Alright, so for Catalan players, the main question is really, uh, what do you want to deal with? And, and what do you want to avoid? If we uh, think about the move g3, this has always been like kind of the not the main way to get the Catalan, but the most direct way, where we're just immediately putting the bishop on, on g2. The main benefit of this one is that you are uh, kind of preventing black from playing the queen's Indian. I mean, black can play b6, but after bishop g2, they obviously can't go bishop b7. They can play d5, but this isn't really what they want to do this early. This is just the Catalan where black played b6. Uh, so if they wanted that, they should just play d5. And uh, just to make a quick point, if black plays d5 here, bishop g2, the, the best move here is far from b6. <laughs> so uh, you have a lot of other moves you'd make before you do that. And then on b6, bishop g2, I mean, if black plays knight c6, then this is already kind of awkward and the knight just simply doesn't, doesn't belong on this square. Um, so this is kind of the main advantage of starting with g3. The drawback, though, is that you're now committed to g3. Uh, so if black plays c5, for example, and we go into a Benoni, then you're committed to playing a g3 Benoni. 
it's very playable, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. And theoretically, this has always been the one Benoni that like top players are like willing to play. Like they're willing to play this position if White is committed to the the G3 system, uh, which is saying quite a bit because the Benoni doesn't have the you know the best reputation at the at the top level. Um, that said, there's a lot of like fight here, a lot of ground to be covered, and I think White can certainly um, certainly fight for an advantage here and just the question is like would you rather play this position or if you start with knight f3 then you're a lot more flexible so against the benoni now you can do a lot of other things and uh you're not committed to just playing g3 here but you can play something with knight c3 and e4 knight d2 one of these main lines or bishop f4 for example that's still very very popular but the drawback to knight f3 is that now black can play the Queen's Indian. Which is a solid opening. Nothing wrong with the Queen's Indian. Very, very solid theoretically. And, and so this is the drawback. So you're choosing, do you want to play against the Queen's Indian or do you want to play the G3 Benoni? And that's kind of the question you, you have to answer. Now, Benoni is pretty rare. I think if you play G3, most players are probably just going to play the Catalan anyway or the Bogo Indian, if that's what they play. But... Um, if they're going for a Benoni, then you're going to be committed to a G3 Benoni, but otherwise you're probably just getting a uh, Catalan uh, either way. Um, with Knight F3, I should mention, um, you're also more flexible against the, the Bogo Indian, like with Bishop uh, B4 check here. Um, we don't necessarily want to play G3 in these lines, so I think the lines with Knight D2 here I think still stand pretty well. Uh, Bishop D2 is probably fine too. Um, so you're kind of just more flexible with knight f3 all over the place, uh, whereas with g3, of course, we're just committing to playing g3 against everything. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, if you guys have more questions, let me know. Uh, Mehmet in the YouTube chat is asking, how about the London system? Well, how about it? <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's a good opening for, let's see, for what it is. We often debate on on my regular channel about the London system. And uh, I mean, what what can we say? <laughs> what can we say about this one? It's a good opening for some players. You know, it's a good opening if you can make it work for you, like all openings, really. But is it the best opening for everyone? I doubt it. I really doubt it. But um, that's just my my personal opinion. And I'm not even approaching it from a theoretical standpoint. As far as theory goes, black equalizes everywhere in every opening. So it's not like we can say the London is uh, a bad try. As far as trying to like get an advantage, especially in rapid chess, it's uh, totally reasonable. Um, but the drawback to me has always been that you just end up getting the same kinds of positions over and over again. And ultimately that just gets a little bit boring and stale. And uh, it's a good like starter opening. If you don't have anything else to play, you can just pick it up and go. I think as far as starter openings go, it's probably one of the best. But beyond that, if you're trying to build like a serious repertoire and, and be like a fully fledged player, then I think it's only, it's kind of like a training wheels opening. It's only gonna hold you back. Well, all right guys, if you have any more D4 questions, let me know. I'm here for you. <laughs> I'm watching the uh, the YouTube chat and the Twitch chat. And feel free, you can ask about middle games, about theory, about um, move orders, transpositional tricks. Or we could just look at the game. Because uh, I've, I've looked at a lot of like classic D4 games, and I'm sure there would be some that I would be happy to to share with you guys. But I don't know, I feel like it's a stream, it should be more more interactive. Okay, question from Vishas. Do you try to avoid the Nimzo? Uh personally I do. Yeah. Um I guess that's one of the biggest decision that a D4 player has to make is whether or not to uh, allow the Nimzo. In fact, the Nimzo is like 
it's basically the same decision as uh, choosing between knight f3 and g3, but on a much bigger scale. It's like, do you want to play against the Nimzo, but at least be able to get whatever line you want against everything else? Like, this is the most flexible move, right? Knight c3. Because um, against the Benoni, now you're not even committed to knight f3. So this one, I mean... It's still considered playable for black, but here you just get everything. You get like f4 if you want, you get knight e2, knight g3, which I really like. Um, you can just do anything you want against the Benoni. The other advantage to knight c3 is that against the qgd, you're not committed to knight f3 either, um, which is which is good as well, because here you can play the lines with bishop g5, put your knight on e2 uh, against the Carlsbad, and well, okay, it's long been considered like a really... Uh, a really enjoyable system for white to play. So the, really the only drawback to knight c3 this whole time has just been the Nimzo. And it's a really tough choice because the Nimzo, as far as I see, is just like a perfect opening. People like to say like, oh, there are no perfect openings. No, the Nimzo is a perfect opening. It's, you develop your pieces, you fight for the center. Uh, there is theory, but there's not that much theory that like you have to know it. Like, if all you understood as black from this position is that, you you know, you just want to play, like, d5 and castle, and then maybe b6, and sometimes c5, and you're putting your bishop on b7 in almost every line. Like, if that's all you know about the Nimzo, that's... You can already get, like, a playable position against every, like, main line. <laughs> so, and imagine if you just know, like, a little bit more, then it becomes, like, a super playable uh, opening. This is just going to be a Nimzo rant, guys, about how good the uh, the Nimzo system, <laughs> the Nimzo defenses. Um, and not to mention against all of the main lines, you know, e3, knight f3, queen c2, black has multiple good options there. So it's not like you just have to like know this, like all these like different lines. So there's not like that much critical theory you have to know, all the ideas make sense and it's a rock solid opening. Now that doesn't mean that it's like not playable for white. As white, there are definitely things you can, you can try and I'll name like the f3 system as being probably the sharpest you can get. The queen c2 system, this is probably like a theoretical one where if you feel like your opponent isn't going to know a lot of theory and you want to kind of test them, I would suggest the queen c2 move. And there are all, uh, all kinds of moves here that are fun to play, like bishop g5 is an idea. Catalan players can play g3 if you want to get like a Catalan style position. And there's knight f3. So it's not like the position is dead, it's a really, really rich opening. but as far as the uh, the theoretical standing goes, really tough for white to get an advantage. Um, but let's talk about the drawbacks of knight f3 for a sec. So I personally prefer this move, but against knight f3, we now have to deal with the queen's Indian. This isn't even a thing on knight c3, because if black goes b6, white just goes e4, and this is no longer anything. This is just white is better. <laughs> this opening is called white has a space advantage and is just clearly better. Uh, so like there's no such thing as the Queen's Indian. We talked about the Benoni, our options are better. Uh, our options are better against uh, d5. Um, and so yeah, we really save a lot of kind of time with this move order. But again, the drawback is the Nimzo. If you want to avoid the Nimzo and play Knight f3, you kind of have to know more stuff. You have to know the Queen's Indian, you have to know something against the Benoni again. You got to figure out what you're doing against d5. And there's also the Bogo Indian, which I think is not a huge concern, but this move is here anyway. So this one is definitely not nearly as difficult to deal with as the Nimzo, but it is a thing uh, that we have to know here as well. So it's not like we get to just avoid the Nimzo 100%. Yeah, a lot of people have trouble against the Nimzo, and so they often switch over to uh, knight f3 or, or g3. But what I would recommend, uh, this chess, is like if you feel like if you're playing an opponent who's like a Nimzo player, but not every Nimzo player is the same. If you think like maybe they're not really familiar with the theory and you want to test them in like the queen c2 Nimzo or the f3 Nimzo, like if your opponent doesn't know a ton of theory, then I think the, the queen c2 line is actually like, you can definitely pose some some problems. Uh, with queen to c2. Um, and then playing either for like a quick e4 or with knight f3. Uh, actually, uh, Gustafsson has a course on, on chess 24 about the queen c2 nimzo that I think is 
is very good. So if you studied that course and then played it against people who don't know that much theory, you, know, you could absolutely pose some problems. Um, so my suggestion would be to kind of keep it in your back pocket. You know, maybe you want to play the Nimzo against some players, but against other players, you'd prefer to play Knight of three and be a little bit more flexible. Uh, okay, I'm getting some more questions coming in. So two questions on, oh, D4, C4 thoughts from Rohan. Uh, I'm a fan, Rohan, D4C4 all the way. I guess a lot of people don't realize this, but the idea behind D4, believe it or not, is to play E4 on the next move. And if black doesn't allow this, we should play E4. But most players here have caught on and they started playing like D5 or Knight of 6. And then we need an extra edge here, you know, if we're going to fight for the center. Because if we play Knight C3, black will play D5 and, and shut us down. I mean, some players play like this anyway, but... I've always felt like this kind of violates classical principles. Instead, white goes c4 and prevents black from being able to establish a pawn on d5, or at least makes black work for it. Now they got to play c6 or e6 in order to play d5 and keep a pawn in the center. But even if they're doing that, well, we get to trade off our c pawn for one of black's central pawns. So this is like something that we're already starting to play for. And we get a little bit, you know, we get to claim that we have some advantage here because now we have an extra uh, central pawn. So, yeah, I'm a fan of d4, c4, big time. Okay, there was another question. What do I think about the Banco Gambit? Yeah, I, I like the Banco. I'm team Banco. I've never played it as black. But being a d4 player, I've always been kind of like annoyed with this one. And I think it annoys a lot of D4 players. So if you're looking for something decent against one D4, I think the Banco Gambit is honestly one of the more uh, underrated choices out there. Uh, you do have to give up a pawn, but so what? <laughs> Lots of people do it. <laughs> so just do it. And like, especially if you want something like dynamic and, and you're, you know, you, you're looking for like winning chances with black against solid 1d4 players. I think the Banco is probably one of the best openings you can uh, come up with. I'll talk about the drawbacks to the Banco Gambit in, in a sec, because there are some very serious drawbacks to it. Um, but as far as having like some kind of dynamic weapon, it's it's a really fun opening. I mean, it's, it's an opening where as black, you just, you kind of learn all of your ideas. You know, like, you know exactly what you're going to do. Right, bishop goes to g7, you trade off the light squared bishops. Let's say white makes some random moves that they always make. Knight d7, and then okay, you just know what you're doing here. Like this knight is probably going to b6 at some point, queen can go to a5, rook fb8. And you just have this like long-term pressure. And it's up to white, like they're going to try to set up with a4, or knight b5, and, and, and all this stuff, but it's... Uh, it's not like white just wins the game here. Like they have to make a lot of moves. They have to watch out for a lot of tactics and it takes a while to push their pawn. And the real, the real like kind of thing for black is that you're actually like okay with traits in the Banco, especially queen traits, which is kind of crazy considering that you're uh, playing this gambit. But there are some different ways of playing this one. Like for example, if we put um, some random position on the board, let's say here, knight f3, go d6, I think we're, we're blundering everything, I'm just making uh, random moves here, actually I want to, let's do this better, let's do bishop d3, oh this is the Carlson Gelfand game where you play knight takes d5, anyway, we're just going to put this position on the board, knight f3, bishop takes a6, takes Queen takes a6. This is the kind of position where black actually wants white to trade queens. Because even in the end game, you get this like typical Banco compensation where your pieces just kind of flood over to the queen side. You play knight b6, knight fd7. Your bishop is just putting long term pressure. I mean, try to play these positions for white and, and see and see how fun they are because they're they're not that fun. You might say like, oh, we have an extra pawn, but it's really not an easy pawn to to push. So long story short, I'm I'm a big fan of the Benko 
and I think it's a very playable opening. The main drawback to it, honestly, is that it's just not a complete opening. Um, for example, like if, if white plays knight f3 here, you can play c5 and b5, but you're not you're not exactly playing your your Benko gambit. Um, there are also a lot of sidelines, like even within the Benko, where white doesn't have to accept the gambit or doesn't have to accept the gambit fully, and then you have to play more of a uh, Benoni type of position. Um, so. The drawback here is that you're not always going to get a Benko. Sometimes you're going to have to play a Benoni. I th still think it's worth it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that should be said. And if white starts with uh, knight f3 or c4, then forget about it. You just need a completely <laughs> different uh, approach here altogether. Uh, why is white's win rate against Binko so big? Well, I don't know. Depends on which database you you ask. So, I have no idea. But um, I would imagine that at lower levels, if you're a well-prepared Binko player, you could be uh, super dangerous. Okay, there was another question earlier. If you guys have other D4 questions, feel free to uh, to send them in. Um, any recommendations against the Schlechterslav from from Dor? Yeah, I have some recommendations. Um, let's let's put it on the board. So the Schlechterslav, <laughs> the Schlechterslav, is the old C6 G6. Um, some players will even play g6 here, which I think is kind of rare, and, and white has uh, more options here, like specifically with takes, takes like bishop g5, I think is playable. Um, but uh, what usually happens is we'll get it when white plays e3. So I, I play the e3 Slav quite a bit, and I'll often see the g6 Slav here, once white is committed to e3. So this is usually how we get it. Um, white goes knight c3, bishop g7, I would go for bishop e2 here, castles, castles, and then this is kind of like the starting position where black gets to like choose what they want to do. And black has actually a, a bunch of moves here. There's like a6, there's b6, knight d7, bishop g4, d takes c4, and like rookie 8. <laughs> These are all these are all moves. Okay, Verbal Kint is saying chess tempo says 40.7% win for white after b5. But what is the, the chess tempo database? Is that like, <laughs> like, like, where are those games from? <laughs> That's what we gotta know. Um, oh, Rabe, I see your question. I can get to that. I can get to that next. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of moves here for, for black. The one I often see, I think, is bishop to g4. Let me put that on the board. And um, here, I think what we do is, I think we take this one and go queen b3. And this is a pretty typical reaction to bishop g4 in the opening. Is take, take, queen, b3, and then you hit the b pawn, and you hit the d5 pawn. Um, this bishop often goes to d2, and then you, you bring in your rook, like maybe rook fc1 or a4, and you get your queen side play going. Um, and yeah, usually white is just like slightly better. Um, h3 actually is also playable here, but you do have to be comfortable giving up this pawn on c4, which I think is playable. There's like always these gambit ideas where you just play b3. And it's like, yep, go ahead, have an extra pawn. I'll play this position with open lines. Like, thank you very much. And I think this this type, type of thing is like uh, often playable. Let me get some arrows here. So we know what we're talking about. Bishop a3, rook b1. This rook can go to d1. We just have the center. 
Uh, actually, as a, a D4 player, one thing would be nice is to um, be comfortable playing positions where you're down a pawn, but you have this kind of long-term compensation. If you can add this to your repertoire, you can be a really dangerous player where you just play with the center, you play with your initiative, and you really punish a lot of players. You know, don't fall into the stereotype just because you're a D4 player means you don't know how to how to sacrifice material. Okay, Niklesh is saying if we play queen b3 immediately and force them to play e6, you get them to a bad schlechter with a bad light squared bishop. Honestly, yeah, I don't think that's going to be the whole story there because if that was the end of it, then no one <laughs> no one would play the schlechter. Um, but yeah, if we want to play queen b3 here, for example, um, I think there's always going to be drawbacks. I mean, for instance, black can take on c4 and go b5. And yeah, we don't really force them to to play e6, unless you're saying take on d5 first and then go queen b3, which is possible. But here, yeah, black would just develop with like bishop e6 and uh, and so on. Um, we could try this one. But in my experience, this isn't really going to do a whole lot because, I mean, pawn on b7 is defended, pawn on d5 uh, is defended, and then we can go uh, knight c6 here. Oh, before e3. Oh, but that's just a totally different story. Yeah. Yeah, if we talk about uh, queen b3 here, unless you're saying knight c3, g6, and queen b3 like this, uh, which is... I guess a different line, but on all these queen b3 lines, usually black is going to take on c4, in my experience, and then play b5, uh, and play more of like a uh, semi-style position, <laughs> semi-slav position. I mean, this is all very playable, but that's kind of what black tries to to go for here. Um, yeah, if they played e6, though, then I, I would agree. This this would just be fantastic for white. I mean, just develop bishop g5, bishop f4, e3, and things are great. Um, the other line I often get is uh, bishop e2, castles, castles, d takes e4. Take bishop g4 like this. And here I think the smartest move for white is just bishop e2, just backing up. And just getting ready to recapture on f3 with the bishop, if black decides to take this one. Hey, Kata, no, I can see Twitch chat. Yeah, no, got some more questions coming in. So let's uh, let's keep going. Actually, there was a question from Instant Crush. What's a simple approach at handling the King's Indian defense with 1d4? Ooh, well, yeah, I do like the h3 line with bishop e3, but I don't know if I would call that a simple approach. But uh, let's put some stuff on the board. If I had to just play a game against the King's Indian right now, I would play h3 and uh, bishop e3. And I think this line is trendy and it's quite fun. Um, but I would, yeah, definitely not say this is a simple system. <laughs> I would say it's a pretty, pretty complicated one. If you want something simple, I would suggest the, uh, the Fianchetto variation. And uh, I know a lot of Kings Indian players are going to hate me for this, and I'm a Kings Indian player myself. Um, so, you know, I get it and I, I apologize, but this is the one that most Kings Indian players don't like seeing. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not like white is just winning here, but you keep your king safe and you don't give black this kind of ready-made easy attack on the king side like they get in a lot of the, the main lines, you know. So if you're someone who like doesn't want to study a lot of theory, you just want to get like a safe position and play some chess and you want to play d4, uh, I would recommend this one. 
you keep the position open when black goes e5 you just take it just don't be proud just d takes e5 keep the position open use your bishop on the long diagonal and, and you play it like it's kind of like an english english opening uh, so this would be my recommendation The Smyslov system is also pretty simple. I used to play this one. And that's with uh, knight c3, knight f3, and early bishop g5 with the idea of playing e3. Um, this one is also like very simple. I don't think it's as annoying as the Fianchetto variation, but it's a very playable one and I played it for, for many years actually and did totally fine um, and the idea is that you're not playing e4 you're just playing e3 so you're just trying to keep the center a little bit more under control so when black plays like e5 or c5 you can kind of choose whether you want to advance d5 or not um, and the idea here is basically like queen c2 bishop e2 and then in some cases you castle kingside, in other cases you can even castle queenside. And uh, very, very simple for white. I, I mean, it's like, I don't even know what to tell you. Just follow basic chess principles when you play these positions and you'll be fine. Come up with some kind of plan, improve your position, try to take some space, look for good exchanges, and uh, you'll be <laughs> you'll be all right. Typical idea is like to castle kingside and then go like rook b1 and b4 b5 just kind of pushing for some space on the uh on the queen side so this one is very very playable as well okay let's see i'm going back and forth between uh youtube and twitch chat there is a question about the semi-slav from rob a uh, who also asked, what is the best defense against d4 and why is it the king's indian? The king's indian is the best, Rob, because as a black, you get a very simple setup, you get attacking chances in all the lines, and get this, you can play these moves against literally everything except for 1e4. Like literally 1e4 is the only move where you can't get a king's indian. That's it. And that's, I mean, you can get something close, but not like a proper, a proper King's Indian. White has to help. But after d4, after c4, after knight f3, you don't have to bother with any of these move orders. You just close your eyes and you play g6, bishop g7. You know, don't get Lafong, right? Don't pre-move. <laughs> just castle. And, and then you're fine, you know? And then you play your King's Indian. So that's why the King's Indian is, is the best, because you can... You just get your types of positions no matter what. Um, but Semislav was asked about as well. And yeah, Semislav is a tough one. Semislav has always been a tough, uh, tough nut to crack. If you like sharp positions and you're ambitious, then I would suggest Bishop G5. You got to deal with a lot of lines here. There's like D takes C4, the... Botvinnik variation, there's h6, bishop h4, and then dc4, the uh, anti-Moscow gambit. But if you're ambitious and you like studying theory and you want to just kill the semi-slav, then I would go for this. I think the question was a practical line against it, so that's going to be not bishop g5, probably not super practical. Um, as far as the practical approaches, you know, there are moves like queen d3 you could play, and uh, your idea is just defend the pawn with your queen. Uh, queen b3 is also a uh, an option here. And then you're going to play like a Catalan style with g3, bishop, g2, and castles. You can certainly do this. Um, most semi-soft players, I think, are probably going to take this one and, and play for b5, something like this. You go back, queen d3, bishop, b7. But these positions aren't, like, as explored in... You know, as far as the theory goes here, like your opponents aren't going to know as much as they'll know against like Bishop G5 or like the E3, the Moran, some of those lines. So this one is kind of a good, interesting choice you can experiment with. You play like E4 here and um, 
yeah, I don't know. These these positions can be fun, and I mean, Black has to be an experienced player, you know, in the semis love to really to deal with them. Um, yeah, personally, I've been playing the E three Slav, and I would maybe suggest this one because against E six, you're a lot more uh, flexible here because our knight isn't developed to C three yet. So in this position, I would play bishop d3, and um, for example, knight d7, go b3, bishop d6, bishop b2, and I would actually play this kind of setup. Um, and then eventually the knight can go to c3, in some lines it can go to d2, but this I actually feel like is very flexible, and you have kind of two, two plans here. You can play knight d2, knight e5, and try to bring the other knight to f3, kind of like stonewall style, even considering f4. Um, or you can play knight c3, and uh, castle, and then play for e4, and like breaking in the center. And both of these plans can give white some some very reasonable chances of, of getting an edge. Yes, it's like a Moran, <laughs> but it's not the Moran, so we're okay. Okay, how is the semi Averbach system? Help me out, guys. Uh, again, I guess against the King's Indian. Semi, semi Averbach, what is that? Is it the bishop e2, bishop e3? Because bishop g5 is known as the Averbach system. <laughs> so bishop e3, I guess, is the uh, semi Averbach. I don't even know. Is this really the official title? You can't just. Like. <laughs> That's not really how it works, right? Like in other openings, like when we think about the knight orf. What is the bishop g5 system even called here? What's the name of this one? Whatever it is, bishop e3 is not called the semi <laughs> bishop g5 system. So I don't know, that's a little bit weird to me. Because, um, you know, we have the English attack and then we have whatever bishop g5 is. Anyway. Um, I think it's a reasonable choice. It's definitely a good uh, surprise weapon against the King's Indian. I personally think, you know, black is fine, but it definitely has uh, quite a bit of venom to it. Um, like all these lines do that involve like an early g4. Um, so the idea behind this one is basically, okay, get everything going, cover the g4 square so there's no knight g4, and then play like g4, h4, h5, g5, and etc. right? Just getting the, uh, getting the king side attack going. It's a really playable line for white. I mean, as a King's Indian player, this was one of the last lines I really like looked into. Um, so I think... I think it's obviously like very playable for black, but there is a lot of value in like finding a sideline that you really like and you ha know all the ideas and then using that as like a weapon, right? Because of course in the King's Indian, most players are going to be familiar with like the main lines with knight f3, castles, and black is going to be very well prepared. So if you can find some sidelines that, you know, your opponents aren't so comfortable against like bishop b3 and then playing g4 or just playing g4 here as some players do. Um, you can, you can definitely try this. Objectively, like, I, I think black's chances are fine, especially against this one, like, I would go c5, because as black, when white is playing g4, you should probably just counterattack in the center, and make sure that you leave your diagonal for the bishop open. Um, my guess is white probably goes d5 here, and then I, for black, I would recommend e6, and just immediately uh, opening up the, the center. So, I mean, in my opinion, I would al already rather be black in this position, but that doesn't mean that the line isn't isn't dangerous. You can definitely, you can definitely make it work. I think with bishop e3, it's a little bit more sensible, because here at least you force your opponent to uh, make a move, and if they go e5, for example, and then you play d5, well, here I think we're already in much better shape as white, because we got black to commit to e5, 
right? So now they're going to play like a5 or something, and then you can play g4 in this position, and then you just get a much better version of the, the whole thing, right? If you can just force black to close down the diagonal for their bishop, then they're not going to get as much counterplay in the center, and now your king can just safely uh, castle queenside. Although don't play queen d2 if your g4 pawn is hanging. Got to go like g5 first or, or something. So yeah, I mean, I think these lines are, are really playable, and if your opponent just kind of relies on typical King's Indian moves, they can get like a really, really dangerous position. Because uh, not all King's Indian players are comfortable, you know, playing c5 in these types of positions, because they're not really, you know, they want to play a King's Indian, they don't really like the Benoni, but if you want to be a good King's Indian player, of course, you have to be willing to, to enter the Benoni uh, at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I remember Vishnu. I remember your game, of course. <laughs> uh okay. The Rick to Rouser, that's just against the classical Sicilian. So we don't call Bishop G five against the Knight or the uh the Rick to Rouser. Okay guys, let's see. I might have missed some questions. I apologize. Um Can I suggest a good counter against the Chebonenko Slav? Yeah, I can try actually. It's been a while since I faced the uh, the chameleon, the Chebonenko. Because um, again, with white, I'm often playing e3 here. So when black plays a6, it's not really considered as as annoying as after knight c3. And I often just play knight c3 here anyway, um, and just transpose. Um, so I think I would go for this line nowadays, like b5, b3. Go like bishop g4, you go bishop d3, e6, castles. Um, we develop our pieces here. Let's say bishop d6. Actually, I feel like I feel like I would rather put our bishop on e2. Let's do this one. Let's say knight d7, bishop b2, e6, castles. We can play this position a little bit with white. You know, we have ideas like rook c1 and h3 and some knight h4 ideas. It's not the most fun line in the world, but this is uh <laughs> this is what I would do. <laughs> Nicholas so disappointed with b3. I'm sorry, man. I mean, the c5 lines uh, they're they're f playable, but they're not uh I don't know. I mean, last I checked Black was doing doing all right here, and, and you know this is what a Chebonenko player wants. You know, these are the positions they dream about, where you take the c5 space and then they just they kill you with e5. I don't know. I never truly loved it. Um, okay, you there are there are some stuff. <laughs> there are there are some things you can do. For example, let's say knight c3, Black goes a6. You can try this queen c2 move. This one, as far as I remember, is pretty sharp and fun. And the point here is that you're sacrificing the pawn and you want to play e4. So if you want something with a little more activity, here you go. You got to be willing to give up the pawn and, and play this position. Like b3 takes and then a takes. And then that's it. You just play the position, just don't worry about being down a pawn or whatever. Just <laughs> develop your pieces, you know, bishop goes to d3, support your center, castle, bishop b2. You know, you have a lot of moves here, rook e1, rook c1. As long as you have moves, you will always have compensation. So this, this I think, could be, could be fun. Yeah. Well, queen b3, I think, is not going to be uh, as good here. Not a huge fan. Think like e6 and... Yeah, I just don't really love these queen b3 moves, to be honest. I feel like you have to be very uh, precise with them. Um, but, okay. Hope that helps. Yeah, you know, this b3 pawn sack, I, actually, I feel like it comes from the Catalan, really. But it's it's become playable in, in many positions. Maybe it's still kind of flying 
under the radar a little bit, but I think the line where this really became known came out of the Catalan uh, in this line. So this is a line that was is still very very popular and theoretical in the uh, in the Catalan, and after um, e3 here. Uh, what black would do is they would go bishop d7, queen e2, and b5, and hold on to the pawn. And then I think there was different different moves here, but like a little while ago, I think they discovered that b3 here is just like, white well, just gets fantastic compensation. And once there's a couple games in this kind of position, people just kind of realize like, yeah, it's a tough one for black to play. Because all of white's moves are, are just so natural and all the pieces just get just get activated. And then this knight can go to either d2 or um, and then to like f3 or sometimes to c3, but I think I think usually probably probably d2 not to block the rook. This knight can jump to e5 and then back to d3 and then the other knight can come to f3. And white just gets fantastic like positional compensation. You know, you just kind of control the board. You have the the bishop on the long diagonal. You have your bishop on b2, and it's very tough for black to to play this position. It's so hard for them to use their extra pawn. So I think once this was kind of discovered, then a lot of these options became much more popular in uh, the Slav as well. Um, for example, now like there's also this line. You can play queen c2 in this position. And then if black takes on c4, you just go e4. And you're like, thank you very much for the center. And then you just go b3. Like, yep, just take the pawn pawn up. But I'm going to develop all my pieces to decent squares. And, you know, you always get compensation in this kind of position. And it's like, you know, all your moves are so easy to make, right? You just can basically play with play with your hand. And, uh, and yeah, I think not easy for, for black to, uh, to handle these types of positions. Yeah, you're welcome. Sign up for my masterclass, guys, and you can ask me all the questions you want. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get more more D4 questions in. What do we want to know? <laughs> Grunfeld is best. Grunfeld's pretty good, I have to say. Yeah, the famous Karthikian Feruja game. That was in the uh that was in the H three Bishop E three Kings Indian. Yeah, Feruja really bungled that one. Oh, what do I play against the Grunfeld? Well, Um, I've done a few things against the Grunfeld. A uh, long time ago, I used to play the Rook B1 lines. Knight F3, C5, Rook B1. And, uh... I mean, I don't... I'm not sure what to say about this one. Because it... I, I mean, it was a really fun line to play, and it's really sharp. Theoretically, it's like, it's always been a, just a huge undertaking, you know, it's like, there's a lot of lines, and I don't know if I would really, like, recommend people to, to put a lot of work and, and study it. Grunfeld is really, like, one of the more double-edged openings out there, because I think it's, like, it's so solid for black, and theoretically, it often stands well, um, but, uh, 
of course black has to know a lot as well and i mean the positions are are sharp and interesting enough that it's not like i mean it's not like black is just going to be scoring better or something um so th there's a lot of things you can do for white i mean this is one line um i did play bishop d2 for a while but um kind of quit this one uh many years ago um not for any particular reason i just felt like there were probably better options and to me it just seemed like black was kind of equalizing really easily in in these lines uh with bishop g7 and then c5 or even in these knight b6 lines i felt like white wasn't really getting uh much at all so um long story short if your Grunfeld opponent knows their stuff, it's gonna be really hard to pose some problems. And if you just if you're just studying the Grunfeld like with the database and you're just trying to find some ideas and like you're checking the engine, like you're just gonna be banging your head against the wall. It's like very hard to find anything. So you basically just gotta find a line that kind of works for you or you understand the ideas where you like the plans and and just play it a lot and consistently to kind of develop a feel for it. So one line that I've been playing quite a bit lately is just the lines with bishop e3. Um, and the reason I got into these actually, well, I was playing them for a little while. Like you can start with knight f3 here, or you can start with bishop e3 uh, and then play knight f3 or rook c1. I was enjoying these lines, but then Magna started playing them like a couple of years ago and he won a lot of games. Like in Norway and all these other super tournaments, he beat MVL, he beat Christchuk, he beat Mamad Yarov. He beat like every like major Grunfeld player with this. And, you know, kind of like made an impression on me. So uh, I started looking into these lines more and I feel like, yeah, they are, they are very, very playable. Um, so Shahid is asking, please explain anti-Grunfeld opening. You're going to have to be more specific. What... What anti Grunfeld are we talking about? We're talking about Knight F3, we're talking about F3, a lot of anti Grunfelds out there. <laughs> um, so yeah, if I had to play a game today, I would I would play this one with Knight F3. And I think um, there's certainly a lot of room for white to to pose problems. Uh, main line for black is like Queen A5, and then we go Queen D2. Black can go for the end game if they want, or they can keep Queens on and, and keep the middle game. And, uh, well, I believe in the center, and I believe in the space advantage. So, um, for white, I'm kind of happy here, but I'm sure Grunfeld players are happy as well. And that's just what we have to live with. It's just going to be a constant, a constant battleground. Okay, let's see. Uh, how about a line against the Dutch? Sure. Um... Well, I've always been a fan of just playing g3 and then putting the bishop on g2 and then asking black what kind of Dutch do they want to play. Do they want to play like Leningrad with g6 or do they want to play uh, classical with e6 or do they want to play like Stonewall? If they go for Stonewall, then uh, I in particular like this line with knight d2 and uh, then bringing this knight to h3 and... Oh, need some arrows. And then this knight can come to f3, this queen will come to c2, will castle kingside, and then eventually this bishop will come out to f4. So I'm uh, I'm a fan of this against the stone wall. And then against like the Leningrad and other stuff, I would just put the knight back on f3. So this is why I'm staying flexible, because sometimes you might want to develop with knight h3. But against the Leningrad, I would just go for uh, knight f3. And one of these lines here, like with c4 and knight c3. And there are different plans here you can you can try as white. There's like queen c2 uh, ideas. And then rook e1 or rook d1 and then playing for e4. You can also play like rook b1 in these types of positions and go b4, b5. Um, well, I've, I've always felt pretty comfortable for white here. b3, bishop, b2 is definitely an idea as well. Uh, so, yeah, there's, I think, different ways you can play against the Dutch. It's not um, the most uh, dangerous opening, in my opinion, to deal with, but it, the positions can get pretty funky. Personally, I've always liked playing against the Dutch. Uh, Petrosian famously said, like, if your opponent is going to play it, don't stop them. 
that's kind of how I feel. I mean, it's not like you just get a big advantage, but it's certainly like a very complex opening. But I would much rather fight against the Dutch than like fight against the Slav. <laughs> you know, something really solid like the Slav, the QGD, that's like banging your head against the wall, you know, trying to get something there. But the Dutch, you get some really interesting positions. So I, I really, I don't mind playing against it. Uh, same with kind of Grunfeld. Grunfeld's a really tough one to crack, but well, much, much tougher than, than the Dutch, I would say. But yeah, at least, you know, you can still enjoy playing those, uh, those middle games. Yeah, 5h4 Grunfeld, I would say, is a pretty sharp option. You can definitely uh, explore this one if you're looking for something dangerous against uh, against Grunfeld players and you want to scare them. This was one of the one of the original H4 lines before this was before Alpha Zero, you know? This was not an Alpha Zero invention. This was like who came up with this one? I don't know. I know Grischuk played it against Magnus in the uh, in the candidates tournament uh, way back when, twenty thirteen. But I don't know if he was the first to uh, to use this at a high level. Um, anyway. Let's see. Can we cover the Marshall Gambit? Yeah, Marshall Gambit, that's, that's a tricky one. Um, the Marshall Gambit comes from the triangle system. Basically this move order or e6, knight c3, c6, and then white playing e4. Of course there's the much more famous Marshall uh, in the Rui Lopez, but that one is not the Marshall Gambit, that's the Marshall Attack, which, whatever, <laughs> it's not a big deal, they're both Gambits. Um, but yeah, this one has always been weird like black takes this pawn if they don't take the pawn if they take here then they're just kind of worse in this position because they have no space and they have a bad bishop you know they have a light squared bishop and they put pawns on e6 and c6 i mean it's like yeah <laughs> it feels like it could have done better than this so if black wants to go here they got to take the pawn then white takes on b4, they take on e4, and then white can choose either uh, developing the bishop or developing the knight. I don't know what's the main line these days. Um, way back when, both moves were considered pretty playable. Um, yeah, it's it's a weird one. It's one of those things where um, it's not a fun position for, for black to play uh, at all. Because <laughs> you have this extra pawn, but your position just is full of dark square weaknesses and you have to defend. So I wouldn't go here as black. But as white, it's not like your compensation is that apparent either. Like, you definitely have compensation and it's very playable, but it's like... Mm, you do get the sense that you can just end up like down a pawn here, like black goes f6 or something and like defends the king and... And you just kind of slowly run out of ideas and then you're just down a pawn. And we already weakened ourselves with this C pawn. Like if this pawn was back on C2, then I would feel like much better about White's White's chances here. Because I would feel like I haven't made as many weaknesses myself. But um, yeah. So yeah, it's one of those lines I wouldn't really enjoy from either side. Uh, but if I had to pick, I would uh, I would take White. I had to choose here because I'd rather be down a pawn and playing for the initiative than uh, than the other way around but that's just me I mean you know I think chess is about choosing openings that we uh, we feel comfortable with you know not necessarily the ones that are that are best Okay, let's see more questions, guys. <laughs> 
What do you guys want to know about D4? I mean, wow, this PGN here is like <laughs> intense. There's a lot of moves. Thoughts on the Russian system? Um, against the Grunfeld, right? This one used to be like a total war zone. Um, I remember looking at this a little bit from White's point of view, because I mean, as a D4 player, you're always looking for something against the Grunfeld. Um, and it, it always seems promising, but there are just so many lines here and there's a lot of just so much theory that it's always just felt like one of the, uh, this is like the Bishop G5 Knight or of the Grunfeld. That's how I would put it. It's just a lot of, a lot of ground to, to cover and very, very sharp territory. Um, and then there was a time when I was kind of toying around with playing the Grunfeld as black. And then this line was like one of the lines that felt like such a headache, like black has to really, really know what they're doing here. Because if, if black just kind of wimps out, you know, and plays like c6 or e6, then, then black is going to be worse here. This is just not, this is not why you play the Grunfeld. So black has to like take on c4 and then choose one of the lines here, like either um, a6 here, or I think like bishop e6 is a move now. Um, I think the main line is, is probably still like a6 and b5. And, uh, and then playing either bishop b7 here or c5. And I mean, I personally, I feel like black is probably doing fine here, uh, theoretically. So I'm not sure if it's really worth exploring from, from white's point of view. But of course, if you're a Grunfeld player, then you you do have to know what you're doing here. That's uh, That's for sure. How do we get queen b3 and knight f3? What do you mean? That's normal. <laughs> oh yeah, I saw that Vishnu. So a question about the move order. So what to do against d6? Because, yeah, against knight c3, you kind of have to worry about e5. I mean, the truth is you don't, you don't really have to worry about this one. Um, these lines with knight f3 are pretty good for white. Like if they go knight d7, then e4, and your white is better in these lines. Um, and if e4 then this these lines are pretty sketchy. I mean, there's like knight g5, I think knight d2 is also playable, um, but something like knight g5, bishop f5, and I feel like queen b3 is the uh, is usually the move here. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's some maybe some tricks here, but generally speaking, white is white is fine. Um, so I think you could just play knight c3 anyway. The real question is what to do on d6, because here, if you go c4, e5, uh, this one's a little bit different, because on knight f3, e4, black can still play f5. And in these lines, I don't know if white really has much, although it's playable. Um, so yeah, as a, <laughs> as a player who doesn't go knight f3 against the king's Indian, you might have to just play e4 here, or you might have to acquiesce to playing knight f3, and then if your opponent wants to go for a king's Indian, then you have to kind of allow it through this move order. But the bright side is that there's not many king's Indian players who start with 1d6, because if you think about it from a king's Indian point of view, <laughs> there's very little reason to play d6 on move 1. If you want to play king's Indian, it's, you're, it's much more flexible to play king's Indian um, is you're just allowing so many more things by playing 1d6 versus what you're avoiding. You know, you're avoiding the f3 lines and the h some h3 lines, but it's really not enough. So 
hopefully you're not going to get a lot of it. Um, but uh, but yeah, it is it is an issue. Uh, some gambits like Budapest. Yeah, click click Mitchy. Uh, I mean, I think the Budapest the Budapest is. Uh, I don't know if it's underrated. It's definitely one of the fun gambits you could play. Theoretically, it's not doing that great, but a lot of people don't really know what to do against it. So I think you can certainly, uh, you can certainly make it work as uh, as black. Um, but as white, I like to take and then just play knight c3 here. Say knight c6, e3, take, and uh, I go for this plan with f4 and bishop d3. And uh, I like this position for white <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah. You can then play like a3 here and queen h5 and knight f3, bishop d2, castles. And it's very fun. I think it's, you just get a really fun position uh, for white. Okay, what to do versus d4, e5 from Byron. Yeah, now we're talking. Let's get into the real stuff. All right, against e5, I think you just take the pawn. And there's a couple things they can do here. All right, so it's not like it's game over. Um, so this line, hopefully everyone knows by now, is like total... This line has been debunked. <laughs> just fully debunked. Uh, you know, it's queen b4, bishop d2, queen takes here. Bishop c3, obviously, we all know this one, right? Don't fall for this. This is a real, real big problem. So knight c3 is the move. And then you're going to go rook b1 next. And you just give the pawn, and uh, but you took the pawn in e5. So now it's equal pawns, but black has spent a bunch of time with their queen. It's like black spent all this time to grab this pawn with their queen, and they're not even up a pawn. So it's, you're like, this is what you do. And then it's, uh, it's game over. Yosef says the Budapest just seems unnecessary to play. There's so many great fighting defenses against 1d4 that once you get over the novelty of being able to sack that e5 pawn, you realize it's just an inferior opening. You know, that's kind of why I grew out of it. Um, because I felt like, yeah, maybe I can just get all the same counterplay, but without, <laughs> without just giving up a pawn. I don't know. I think it's totally playable still. Um, like, I think Ferruja played it like not that long ago and made it work i mean especially in blitz and rapid i think it's just fully 100 percent uh reasonable and you can do it but like most things it's just not for everyone see the the thing is people think like oh either an opening is good or either an opening is bad but the truth is is that some openings are good for some players and other openings are good for other players so the budapest might not be the right opening for you but it might be the right opening for someone else and the Grunfeld might be a great opening for a lot of people, but it might not be the right opening for you. Just all depends on how you see the game and what kind of positions you enjoy uh, handling. So I always try to caution players, you know, against oversimplifying things. Because people will just make these like crazy generalizations like, oh, my opponent played the Karo Khan and I lost. So <laughs> I guess the Karo Khan is a good opening. Like, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not how it works. Well, there's a lot of other options out there, right? But there's drawbacks to all of the options, you know? Now, earlier I said the Nimzo is a perfect opening, so we're going to leave the Nimzo aside. But there is a drawback to the Nimzo, and that is that your opponents don't have to let you play it. Like, it's not a full opening. <laughs> the biggest question for Nimzo players is, what are you going to do in this position, you know? So... Yeah. Nothing is free. Nothing is free on the chessboard. No, no, I don't. I don't like the Bogo Indian at all. Yeah, I think I think the Bogo Indian is pretty. I mean, it's playable, but I don't like it. But see, that's the thing. What doesn't work for me might work for you, and what works for you might not work for for other players. You know, 
that's how it goes. Uh, David's asking, what do you suggest against the King's Indian? Um, we mentioned a little bit earlier. So if, if I had to play against the King's Indian right now, I would play h3 and bishop e3. And I think these lines are a lot of fun. Caruana started playing them uh, a couple years ago. Um, and I, I like it. I think it's a lot of fun. I try to play g4 here, especially if black goes e5. We'll close it up with d5. And then we'll play for this plan with g4. And the difference here compared to the lines where white's knight is already on f3 is that here the knight can go to e2 and g3 instead, which I think is going to be better for white's attack. Um, sorry, Vishnu, I'm giving away all of our secrets. <laughs> but I'm not sure if that is what I would suggest for, for everyone, because I think you have to kind of know a little bit of theory uh, to make this line work. You can <laughs> look up my video on this and um, get some more detail. I guess if you YouTube opening deep dive King's Indian, Bishop E3, I am Kostikovitsky. I think that would be enough tags that will come up on YouTube. Um, but uh, yeah, if I had to just suggest some random lines, you know, because you might not want to learn a bunch of theory, then the ones I mentioned earlier were the Fianchetto system, which I think is a pretty simple and safe line for white to play, uh, where you just castle, maybe you Fianchetto your other bishop, and it's like a pretty sensible uh, line and set up to go for. Or you could do the uh, Smyslov system that I used to play, which is also simple and maybe not even as complicated as the Fianchetto line, where you just go bishop g5, you get your bishop outside the pawn chain, you play e3, and you can see my arrows from before uh, as to what to do with the, <laughs> the rest of your pieces. Just play normal chess, control the center, expand on the queen side, don't hang your pieces, and then take your opponent's stuff when they give it to you. That's very important. Um, okay, guys, I'm going to have to wrap up soon, so I don't know if I'll be able to get to all of the remaining questions. Um, there's one from Shachmat that's interesting. I would like to play the Semislav, but I dislike the Stoltz variation, Queen C2. And do I know any active plans for black? But that's the... Queen C2 is where you get the... You get something very similar to the Moran. So I feel like we should be able to find something. You're talking about this one, right? Um, so yeah, I know on bishop, on bishop d3, you're just ready to take on c4. And then b5 and, and so on. Um, so on queen c2, I guess most people go bishop d6. I'm sure you're fine with g4 because you're looking for, for active play. But... Uh, If they go bishop d3, then you can take and you get your Moran lines anyway. So I feel like semi-soft players are usually pretty pretty happy here. Um, maybe you're not so comfortable with b3, but if they play b3 early, then you got to go for e5. Because b3 is the only move they can play where they don't let you like take on c4, because then they can take back with the pawn. But against b3, you always have these e5 ideas. And, uh, and then you can get some activity here. You might have to play with an isolated pawn, but uh, certainly, um, if you're looking for, for something active, then this is what, what I'd recommend. If you don't wanna go for just kind of the, you know, regular b6 and bishop b7, because I understand these positions aren't the most fun for black to play. So I understand why you want to avoid them when you can't like take on c4 and, and go b5 and stuff. So yeah, I would try to get an early e5 in if they play b3. <laughs> Click Mitchy, I have seen that rook sacrifice uh, from the h4 Grunfeld. Um, yeah, it was super sharp. I remember checking it with the engines of 2013 and 2014 and uh, back then they had no idea what was going on. Um, <laughs> so, but I don't know what would be happening today. It'd be interesting to check with like the latest engines and stockfish and stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Shakmat. 
Um, okay, guys, I think I'm going to have to wrap up for now. But uh, that was fun. Hopefully, y'all uh, learned something about playing 1D4 um, or middle games or what have you. Um, once again, I'm going to be doing this master class for CoChess.com starting this Monday, November 9th. And it's going to be a weekly class. It's going to be like every week. I think the time is 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, if you go to CoChess.com, you should see it. And it should just have the time listed in like your local time zone to, to make it uh, easy for you. So 5 p.m., that's going to be pretty late for, for Europe. So this is going to be more if you're awake at this time. Um, but yeah, you can sign up at CoChess. I think the first class is on discount, 50% off uh, for, for just six bucks. So that'll be cool. You can sign up, ask me all the questions you want. And um, oh, yeah, thanks for thanks for the link there, Perpetual Stalemate. For the Twitch chat, you guys can can follow that link if you wish to uh, to sign up. Uh, if not, no worries. I will catch you guys all later. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of uh, rest of your week.